Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Eric Kasper and this is uh, Marina Afka and we are hosting the second year of the Complex Systems uh, and Development Seminar Series. What do we call it? Complexity and Development Seminar what? Series. What? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, what should I say about this? I think that's it. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're going to have these all throughout the spring term. Um, next month, we should have a seminar about networks and uh, mapping cities as they change. Um, so I'll let Maria introduce our speaker Thanks. for today. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, as Eric said, so the seminar series started last year. We're continuing it. The idea is that it's helping us grapple with these new ideas of complexity, science, theory, practice, and really focusing on what it means and how we work, both as researchers, but also broadly for the, for the sector of international government. They're intended as um, cross-campus uh, seminars, so if you if you can speak to your friends across campus and, and um, get them engaged, that would be great. But today, we have Jody Akehead joining us. Um, and many of you will know Jodi because she did her PhD here at IDS. You completed last year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so Jodi worked at the New Economics Foundation where she focused a lot on uh, well-being. Yeah. Right? Um, and then she came to IDS and she started off working with the Valuing Volunteering program, which was with VSO. And she led the component in the Philippines. And she did that while being a VSO volunteer and doing a PhD. So, and having a couple of children, I might add. Yeah. yeah. Took a while. Uh, <laughs> um, so, and, and now Jody is putting together her work around complexity and, and how you apply that practically, methodologically, um, together with her work on well being. Mm -hmm. And she focuses on organizational change and, and culture. And she works for an organization called Friday. Friday. <laughs> um, but today, Jody is going to be taking us to the field. And she's going to be talking to us about what does it actually really practically mean to engage with the ideas of complexity um, as you're running a large research project and you're doing that as a PhD person. So welcome, Jody. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, the last couple of years of my PhD, I was sort of in my own PhD bubble and I was juggling children and trying to write stuff. And so it's very nice to kind of be able to reconnect with other researchers um, and not just babies. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to try and talk for about half for now to 40 minutes and leave some time for questions because I think there's quite a lot to discuss here in terms of how we, um, I mean, in the PhD, you obviously get quite a lot of freedom within certain parameters to research how you want to and use the methods and approaches that you want, but how do we speak more authoritatively about the value of this way of doing research to get more funding um, to work in this way? Um, I'll get this to. There we go. Okay, so I, my starting point of this is that the world is inherently complex and we can use complex systems um, theory to study human systems. Um, and this presentation really is about what this means for the way that we design and ex execute research, really. I'm going to try and take some complexity. Um, maybe I need to point it this way. I'm going to take some complexity concepts after I've spoken a little bit about my research context and just try and bottom out what that meant when I was in the field in terms of the decisions I made, how I designed the research, the specific methods, how I layered um, analysis. So you can start to see some of this stuff come to life. And as I go through, I'll drop in a couple of findings here and there to try and show you what I was able to see and um, Kind of bring to life with this lens um, and this approach to doing research that I probably wouldn't have been able to have done with a kind of classic 
social science research, positivist, deterministic kind of um, research paradigm, which is really where I grew up um, in psychology. Um, I've got a couple of degrees way back when in psychology, and that was kind of, that's where I was learning from. So a lot of social science, a lot of, um, sorry, uh, social research indicators, a lot of um, um, sort of studies in snapshot rather than looking at processes through time, case studies rather than looking at patterns and systemic properties of systems. A um, couple of slides on what I was doing. So I was there in the Philippines for a couple of years. This is the island of Bohol. I, w I worked across many different sites in the Philippines and we did some stuff internationally as part of this um, project. And I was looking at how volunteering works, when it works, mainly in terms of its contribution to poverty alleviation, sustainable development, things like that. Specifically, the PhD uh, inquiry became about um, the existence of social networks, um, people's well-being experiences in those networks and how those two came together to enable collective action which was not something I knew much about before I went into this um, research process. Um, I, under the Valuing Volunteering project, we were using um, Danny Burns's sort of methodological approach on participatory systemic action research. It's a mouthful, but it's full of lots of beautiful words. Um, so participatory, working with people, but I would emphasize particularly in the co-production of analysis. So, I mean, often we think about how we involve people in generating data and insights, but um, I spent a lot of time analysing in the field with people, moving insights around the system, which is a bit more the systemic stuff. So how we are connecting conversations and activities across a network of people. Um, and then the action research being about building some of those insights into cycles of reflection, action, testing, and um, re kind of assessing where you are and then going around to getting another action research cycle. I actually, once in the field, this became, um, I broke this down into two different things. So I had a series of participatory systemic inquiries going on, which are much shorter. And then one piece of action research that kind of set alongside the research inquiries. So I could grab insights from the systemic inquiries and then feed them into the action research, which was like my testing ground, if you like. So things that we'd heard, we'd validated, we could then actually build into cycles of action and see um, whether they had the intended effects that people were expecting. Um, so that's just on the research. Now I'm now going to talk through five complexity concepts that were evident throughout my research and bottom out a little bit what that meant, give you some examples of what I did, how it affected the way that I worked. Um, emergence, so this is the definition that I'm using at the moment, new properties, possibilities, capacities arise in systems. So a system could be a family, a workplace, a network. In the case of where I was, it was a watershed ecosystem spanning six municipal boundaries. Um, and that act is connecting and interacting in new ways, which are distinct from the properties held by the interacting parts. So what does this mean Epistemolo epistemologically? It means you need to kind of be willing to be surprised and seek out the unexpected in the research because these things are not going to combine and interact in ways that are highly predictable from the outset. And uh, methodologically, it means choosing an approach that doesn't um, restrict your field of vision too early on. So it's very different from a classic social research paradigm where you would spend a lot of time in hypothesis generation and then be going out to test it in terms of validate it, verify it or falsify it. I mean, I literally went into this thinking, I want to explore how well-being affects social change. I mean, that was kind of as broad as it was. And I had some questions un underneath that, but there wasn't anything um, more prescriptive. Um, so how did I do that. I've got to point this way. So when we're in uncertain territory, it's quite useful to work with a compass more than a map. So I didn't have like a detailed, detailed plan. But what I had was, um, I suppose, the mindset to go in, spend some time, test a little bit, see what happened, 
check where I was, reorient myself a little bit further. So I was kind of moving around the system rather than kind of have my research plan, um, what I would call like paper romance and just being there to implement that. Practically, I mean, I, I felt like I was just being parachuted into the Philippines. I'd never been there before. I didn't have a strict hypothesis. I had no research sites. I didn't know anything. I didn't know language. I didn't know much about the culture. I didn't know how politics worked. Um, I didn't really have any established relationships. Um, and I had a bunch of my own assumptions based on how I'd done research before, based on what I knew about well-being. I knew I wanted to explore well-being, but I had um, most of my stuff had come from um, which what one psychologist in the field describes weird people, which is Western educated, industrialized, rich, developed. Um, that's mostly what well-being, that's where mostly where the research comes from, those sorts of weird um, participants, which are in no way representative of the world at large. Um, but I would actually say, in retrospect, parachuting into a place is not a bad way to start in terms of doing complexity-based research because when you go into somewhere like that, when you're dropped in, you are totally alive to what you're experiencing around you. Like you, And you get this distance from the theory and all the stuff that you've read because you're in an unknown territory, so you're, all of your senses are kind of um, heightened as they would be. if you're. So actually it was a good starting point. I was very alert and engaged and having this lively relationship and conversation with everything around me because there was an awful lot to learn. And I had some, you know, this looks a bit hopeless, but I had like some, <laughs> um, had some assets, I suppose. Um, and I'll come on to this in a minute, but I had given myself loads of time in the research design to em like immerse locally. I had one network connection through VSO, which is a guy I'd had one Skype conversation with. And from that, I was able to nurture that relationship, which led on to others and others and others. So that was a really important aspect. That was an important asset of mine. Um, I had practiced and practiced in participatory approaches. I'd done training with Danny. We'd gone out onto the streets of Brighton to um, investigate homelessness. Like I, had I hadn't just read about these things. I'd lived and done them. And so I felt like I had, comp you know, I had a lot of methods in my back pocket, um, which allowed me to walk into different situations and feel like I could run a process that would elicit something useful in the early days. And then I suppose I just had to be very sort of open-minded. I had to think about who I was as a person and how I wanted to do this research. So I'm kind of very naturally someone who's like, right, let's get this done, da da da, da. You know, I want to like take my well-being and fire my knowledge at the target <laughs> of existence. But it was like, actually, you need to kind of like step back and be like, I'm just going to absorb for a bit and see where those insights take me. So in the design, this generic inquiry phase was really important. And if you think I was in the field probably for the research, the PhD, this bit was about 14 months. I was in the Philippines for two years. So six months of that I spent just basically <coughs> seeking to like connect with people and learn from them. And I did lots of like, you know, traditional methods, like ethnographic type stuff. You know, I lived with people. I walked and talked to people in markets and schools. I just <laughs> chatted to people informally. Um, I lived with volunteers. I lived with um, members of the communities. So I spent a lot of time familiarizing myself um, and starting to form my own networks. Um, mainly it was around, if I suppose if this is six months, about four months of that nearly was spent relationship building and understanding the watershed and the scale of it and the logistical practicalities of doing systemic research at that watershed scale. Um, and then I'd say the last bit of it was adapting and designing methods. Once I was there, once I had some idea of the problem context and what was coming out of it, I was actually taking, I was actually designing methods live there um, and looking at how I would um, interrogate what I wanted to look at, but then also just customise to the local specificalities and um, cultural aspects, my language limitations, so there's a practical aspect there too. Um, and out, out of this period, it was a really rich period in some ways because I got loads of stuff out of it. You know, I understood the problem context through time. I had my relationships. I had 
you know, I'd, I'd engage and inspire people in this, and they wanted to come along the journey with me. I had a group of, you know, researchers that were going to research with me. And I had first-hand experience. I'd been part of community action days. I'd been, I'd witnessed pretty much a full cycle of volunteers come through the watershed. They're in three-month cycles. I'd, I'd kind of just lived it a bit so that's sort of experiential knowledge so I was obviously listening to what people are telling me but I'd also been part of it too um and I developed my methods and I was like dead sure about them because I'd kind of developed them in context and I'd been able to um play with them um okay so my second concept that I was going to talk to is interrelatedness so a complex system is made up of multiple elements, dimensions, levels, which are connected and interdependent on each other in their environment. And this, for me, coming from a, like a paradigm of psychology, this is kind of one of the, the most mind-expanding concepts in the sense that it's saying knowledge generation is in the interplays. It's in the space between us. It's in that co-space. So it's coming out of the individual into actually what do we learn and know with one another through dialogue, through interaction. That's a very different space to be than classic psychologists that might be doing reflexive practice, introspection, things like that. Um, I knew that I wanted to work across different levels of the system. And what I did was basically map those levels of the system to my methods or my, my inquiry lines, because that was kind of a visual for me, a visual reminder that what I needed to be doing was moving up and down levels of the system, in and out levels of the system. So for these are the main levels here. So I have um, the generic inquiry that I was talking about where I was collecting a lot of data on social norms affecting how people felt and the action that was taking place. I had relational inquiries which were looking at the social networks. So volunteers were doing, they didn't have power in the traditional sense, they didn't have resources, they didn't have money, they didn't really have the respect of a lot of the people on the management council of the watershed. But what they did have is this amazing capacity to build relationships and form networks around their, the things that they wanted to achieve in the watershed, around environmental protection. And then I had the well-being, sort of interpersonal, how, these, how people are experiencing their interactions and what does that tell us about the power of the network. And then I operated within these three levels. And then I, they were kind of, um, so just as an example of something, I would say, be taking a social norm and looking at how that affected someone's sense of competence, which then affected how they interacted in the network. So I was, move, I was bringing insights and weaving them through and in and out of these levels of the system. And then I had them encompassed by a linking inquiry, so because I was part of this value and volunteering project, I had access to really experienced practitioners in the field of well-being and environmental management where I could take my findings and test them in those spaces. So the things that were emerging from the watershed, quite quickly you'd learn people would either relate to or contrast it with their own experiences, and it was a really good way of validating what was more of a systemic level finding or something that was very specific to the research context that I was in. Um, and then I had the action research inquiry, which, is, which was within the ecosystem locally, but it meant that I could pick off insights here and then feed them into the way that me and this group of um, young people were trying to affect change in the watershed. So we could figure out what was working and what wasn't. Um, and this is kind of where I got to. So in terms of an example of what you get when looking at interplays and um, the knowledge that you get, I ended up with a system map um, which basically described the problem context that I found, which was the ecological scale of the watershed, which was enormous and which worked on environmental grounds, created very real dilemma, dilemmas for people in the human system because it meant that people had to work across like traditionally bridging and linking social ties in social capital parlance. Um, and this was difficult for people. They didn't necessarily have the confidence to do it. They were working across huge power differentials and dynamics. And there was a massive disincentive, therefore, to um, engage with people. So what we had was uh, inertia, basically. And um, there are a couple of other factors um, reinforcing this main dynamic here. Um, and this all looks lovely now, and it's got really nice implications for the way we um, you know, organise um, social action in environmental 
um, systems, um, about something specific about the way Filipinos respond to natural disasters and things like that in terms of their culture of resilience. But at the time, this was like a total headache. This was like the end of that generic inquiry phase. It was like, this was, and this is often the case, you know, I spent six months there. Their frustrations were my frustrations. I was starting to feel this sense of like, I picked this site because it had this active research council. It had like, um, it had like, a, it looked really democratic. It looked really participatory on paper. It had like some kite marks or some international bodies saying this is how you do watershed management. And where I got to was actually no one was doing much at all. And this felt very intractable. This felt very difficult. So then it was a case of like, well, what am I doing here? In fact, what are any of the volunteers doing here? Like, we felt like little drops in the ocean. And so this is sometimes where you get to when you look at systemic complex interactions is that actually you start to think, I don't know where to go from here. Um, so... I think if I was in the classic social research paradigm, I would probably have just collected more data on this somehow in the hope that that would kind of, I'd figure out a way forward. But I sort of stopped and I actually went back to the research, I went back to the theory and I thought, what is, what is in this picture that's of interest? And I went back to the people that were infusing so much about the power of volunteering because I met plenty of them. And I, I went back to specific things I'd learned from them and quotes and things like that. And I was like, people would talk to me about the subtle nature of volunteering. They would talk about easing the boulder for change. They would talk about not so much about things happening, but about shifting in perspectives. And, and I started to go back to what I knew about well-being. And I started focusing in much more on the processes of change than what people were achieving, I suppose. And um, so it focused me a lot. And then I set, layered my method and analysis alongside that diagram you saw earlier and thought, OK, so let's take some of these stories of change that I've been collecting through very open ended. And, you know, tell me a time when someone's helped you to do something in your community. And then we mapped a social network to that. So, OK, so here's your story of change. Who did you interact with? In what order for the events in this story to come about? And we mapped that. And then I got people to um, reflect on the, how they felt in those interactions and how they felt like, the, what the qualities were of those interactions um, and how they felt in relation to the other actors. So I started to layer, and what I realised is that I wasn't on my own. I didn't have to figure all of this out on my own. And actually you can bring people into trying to figure out the processes and the, and the deep dynamics. And you can do this also with reflection. So at the end of these processes, I was building in opportunities for people to do their own analysis. So um, is there anything you would change about your network map? Is there anything you would have done differently in your story? Um, how do you think other people felt in, in your network? And what would you do differently now to change that dynamic? So they were doing the analysis with me. And that helped loads. Um, and what I would say is systemically, so then what I did is this happened at an individual level, so with lots of volunteers and actors in the network, and then once I got a story of change from one actor, and they had, say, five or six people in their social network, I went out to those people in that network and said, can you tell me about that day that you tackled solid waste management or the, you know, the day that you planted all those trees? Um, and they would... Oh, sorry... Um, and they would talk about how they experienced those networks and how they experienced that story of change. So I was able to move these insights around the system and validate. Um, okay, attractors. Social landscapes are made up of ideas or positions or activities around which people are um, people and activity are centred. So we organise our lives around our identities. Um, attractor based into stable configurations of interacting variables mutually reinforcing one another so sometimes people say in complexity research that you can't make generalizations because every situation is different well actually i mean when the system is fairly stable then you do get some 
level of general things that you can generalize when the system is starting to shift into unstable configurations of interacting variables then you're starting to look at something quite different and certainly the volunteers were in there disturbing the usual status quo so there was a ability to map things um and to search so, so what that means sort of from a practical point of view is you're looking for patterns and you're looking for those attractive bases. You're looking for boundaries of a, of a system. Um, you're looking for when things might change, but you're also looking for those patterns. Um, and that's something that I probably wouldn't have easily got from kind of like case study type research or if I was just doing action research with one or two groups of people. So I use diversity sampling, which is something that I got from the storytelling project, The Global Giving, where you actively just seek as many different perspectives on your research findings as possible. Um, so I moved around all of these different spaces. I mean, I spent a lot of time. I thought my way in was going to be up here with the, the Watershed Council, and as, as it turned out, they weren't very active. So my way in was with the volunteers because they were the people that were trying to do some kind of action and environmental action in the system. And then that linked out to all the people that they'd established in their networks. And I was working across all these different spaces. Um, okay. um, and I think one of the things that you think about when you're going to do this kind of work, you think, okay, so I don't have a set hypothesis. I don't have it clearly bounded who my actors are going to be. You know, I'm moving across this whole system. I'm actually working across something that's quite large in geographical scale. Am I ever going to get to the point where I think that I've, I've got an insight that's worth sharing with anyone? Um, and resonance is just really, really important, whether you call it saturation or I think Danny calls it resonance. But actually, it doesn't take you long to get to a point where you think, ah, actually this is something very real, that people are saying this again and again to me, or I take this finding and I take it to another group, are they validating it, are they building on it? And so you quite quickly, if you just structure your research, so you say well, I'm going to have, often in participatory research you want to have, you want to make it safe for people to share, so I had different stakeholder sessions initially, so I might work with some volunteers, I might work with people in local government, I work with young people, I'd work with residents, and I'd be in these spaces testing and creating data, I suppose, and then I could seed the insights from one group to another, and then when I'd done run all these parallel sessions, I could bring those, or those sort of were sequenced from the different groups, I could bring it into a multi-stakeholder session. So you're then deepening the analysis once again. Um, and then I'll show you in a minute um, a storyboard approach I used for this and um, which worked really really nicely um yeah i think i'll leave that there i'll come back to it later and then the other thing i did is use spaces of learning beyond the watershed so i knew that i was collecting stories of change in a very particular space on a very particular set of issues but there's some really great work being done out there so this is um mark maxson's work at the global <coughs> giving storytelling project He's collected like 57,000 stories of change and he's got a really neat way of using his... Um, so you can basically collect stories in a very simple, like very similar um, framework to what he's done. I work with him and I, um, I've got a couple of questions in that I wanted, but basically it was, a, you know, tell us a time that someone has done something to help you in your community is roughly this, the collection, the story that you're collecting. And then there are some questions that allow the storyteller um, to analyze their own story. But basically, then you can plug in your stories and you can build and you can look at that against the reference collection. So it allowed me to go, okay, I've got a collection of stories here. How much are they telling me something very specific about where I am now, or are they saying something that resonates under, uh, across a much bigger scale? A much bigger pattern and so I could learn for example that um, my story collection had more examples of fun like learning and doing through fun than most of the other stories in his collection and um, which kind of resonated with the way that volunteers would go and work and generate energy and energize and mobilize people around environmental work 
So it just gave me a bit more confidence to be able to reference something um, out there. So that I really recommend that um, approach. Um, and with the use of attractors, I suppose what you're looking for... So when people say you get simplicity, the other side of complexity, what they're often talking about is stable state systems where you're in an attractor base and nothing much is is changing or you've got a few things that are happening that are holding the behavior in that um, in that system. And I would say with my networks, I got to sort of three, three aspects, three qualities of those network interactions quite quickly through this research. So I could see that when people felt personally motivated, when they felt that they were collectively competent and when they felt socially bound to one another, they were much more likely to engage in the in the action and repeatedly do so. Um, so it's an example of what I would have what came out, and this was a <laughs> this is a total surprise to me because for those who know anything about um, theory of well being, this is like one of the most developed universal theories of human motivation that's out there. And so I circled back to something that I was thinking I was going to go away, and it was like I was going to get into a different cultural context, and it was like I was you know going to develop a whole new theory and actually I came right back to some core fundamentals of human behavior but mapped onto relationships and networks which was different from a psychological perspective. Feedback, loops of information back into the system and label it to adapt, evolve and learn. Negative feedbacks dampen and keep things the way they are, the status quo and positive feedbacks amplify. And what was interesting, so this is where I used the storyboards to, to kind of look at more causality, so I could abstract and then have a discursive dialogue, um, dialogue with people about um, the findings. So this is bringing analysis quite early on into the field work. So where I've been collecting insights, I just create five thematic boards. I got this from Danny's work. It worked really nicely. So you're kind of grabbing the, the main themes, the main headlines, but then you're also peppering that with detail. You're peppering it with a quote here or there, which allows people to kind of understand the concept, but it also straddles this line that you have to do in complexity research between the kind of abstraction of something and the uniqueness of what's going on, or to be able to say, this is a pattern, and this is something that is particular to this situation. Um, and I would take these into all different spaces. They just became the starting point of a lot of different discussions. So I held those storyboards constant and then fed them into, when I was describing those um, circles earlier, I'd have multiple stakeholder sessions and then I'd have like um, a multi-stakeholder session. Um, and we got insights that I wouldn't have found any other way like that. So for example, um, the sense of relatedness and trust was really important um, for social networks that, that worked and functioned well. Um, but um, what we were able to identify is that that sense of relatedness, if it was positive, straddled cycles of volunteers, it, it traversed time, it, went, it transcended time, sorry. So it gave us a much more systemic perspective. And then what I did is laid, <laughs> I laid these storyboard discussions and we did causal mapping on them in a world cafe um, approach. So we had, I had five storyboards with a key finding on each. We had five tables, five groups. We had tablecloths and people were mapping causally as they went round. So I'd sort of just layered a few participatory approaches together there. But it, it, and then there was a discussion at the end, but it became really um, good for identifying feedback loops. Um, I'm gonna not talk about that one yet. And then this one, sensitivity to starting conditions. Um, change is path dependent, so you can look back but not forward in a way. So what something that happens has a big effect on what happens next. So this is where being able to research processes of change rather than snapshots becomes absolutely essential. So the fact that I was there long enough to see how things travel through time rather than just doing a snapshot survey or even taking a snapshot case study of what a situation is at any particular point in time, I was there long enough and I was looking at processes. And I was staying alert to uniqueness. So the particular context I was working in, which was Filipino context, where social interactions are really, really key, I suppose, to 
life and culture there, but they also have a very distinct, they draw a line, I suppose, between the inner, insider and outsider interactions are handled very differently. Um, I had historic aspects of the management council and how it's been set up and things like that. And then I had my actors. So, for example, the volunteers were outsiders. They were volunteers. They were young. They were from a position of vulnerability. And that set a whole chain of relating in the, in the, in the social network that led to change in a way that a traditional power holder wouldn't have been able to have done. And then I used my action research to test insights. So this was a group of young people. I worked with them over a year alongside all the other research. And so we were thinking, OK, can we use our social interaction to leverage local support for the youth group? Can we use relatedness? And they identified all these people that they needed to get on board with their idea for change. And these were some of the things that we did. So they took me to meetings. And this is stuff that we've learned in the inquiries that was effective, that we were then testing out, and then we were able to deepen our understanding of what worked and what didn't and why through reflective practice at the end. And massively for the volunteering sector, what we got to, I suppose, is being able to identify the different effects of, of well-being and social network on two parts of collective action. One's just on the mobilisation of people and the energising of it, and then the other side is on sort of more on the social change. When you look at when you look at the models that they're using in volunteering to express its value, it's much its value for money, its theory of change stuff. What they're asking is, what can volunteering achieve and deliver? You know, what poverty can it alleviate? What sustainable development? Whereas when you talk to people, what they are talking about is what volunteering can initiate and what volunteering can amplify. So it's able for us to position volunteering in a different way, this lens. And actually, you know, they were making it easier for actors to fall into patterns of helping one another, just their presence. So when you think about volunteering and how it's funded and how it's programmed, that's relevant because at the moment we fund a load of volunteers to go somewhere. But you could be attaching volunteers to already established development programs to play that energising and that mobilising role and pepper them throughout. And so that would require a much greater number of partnerships between volunteering sector and other players in the development landscape um, and I'm coming out of time but I just wanted to say with risk one of the biggest things was staying focused with this kind of very broad brush approach to um, research and you know write date you know you have to you have to kind of write notes on everything that you find but you have to stay focused on on the insight so don't just make notes about everything Make notes about the things that sort of look like insights, test those and move on and build from that way rather than just basically collecting a ton of data and then thinking, how on earth am I ever going to make sense of this on my own? Um, and then this is Dave Snowden's framework for leading in complex, well, in different settings, but the complex one. And, and that is just, it's much more about probing, sensing, responding and being... Um, responsive yourself to what's emerging than it is sort of having your research mapped out and then um, going about implementing it. And it just is a very different mindset, um, but it can be as rigorous. And I think with rigor, you know, we have to probably think about separating the outcomes from the means. So, you know, everyone wants their research to be credible, dependable, trustworthy. I mean, that's what we're shooting for. And in the classic social research paradigm, the positivist one would say, you know, these sorts of things are important. Complexity is going to have problems with neutrality. It's going to have problems with um, um, objectivity because it says we don't exist. Human systems aren't closed systems. So the moment we're there as a researcher, we're affecting it in ways that we can see or we can't see. We could be affecting it and it doesn't shift that attractor basin anywhere, or it shifts it massively, or probably more in a more complex way, it's having some effect, and then when other variables interact with it, it can take us in slightly um, strange directions. And I think that when I'm looking at using complexity research to enable development, to enable positive social change, you know, I'm thinking more about how do we build empathetic concern? How do we allow people to connect more to each other and their different perspectives within an ecosystem? And we're trying to create practical insights that people can use on the ground. So in a way, my 
I'm oriented towards what I'm providing, I suppose, and helping on the ground than I am the wider research community. So, and to do all of this stuff, you know, you need to be very self-aware. I think you have to relate, relate, relate with people. Um, you have to be fairly transparent. I mean, that comes through an action research methodology so that people know the decisions you're making and why. Um, and, yeah, try and... You're basically aiming for resonance in that system for this to be meaningful to people. Um, and I've got some tips there that I will um, leave up because we can come and talk about those as we do a QA. and a um, But I would say... Do write a research plan. That's the one thing I would say. It sounds like totally contradictory, but you have to write a research plan to have thought through um, the detail of it. Even if you end up scrapping quite a lot of it when you get there, there's still a discipline to writing a research plan, um, even if you're willing for it to be totally torn apart <laughs> by the messy complexity and reality of being being there, I suppose, and being alive and engaged in the research process. Thank you. Thank you, Jodie. Um, so we've got 15 minutes or so until 2, and some of you might have to leave. We invite you to stay till 2.30, though, if you can. Um, but, yeah, questions. Shall we take a couple at a time? Yeah. yeah? So any questions for Jodie? Could you say a bit more about having many methods mm. but then being customized? Yeah. Um, <coughs> and how did you gather or gain or go about the different methods? Um, did you actually search at the same time? Yeah, <coughs> so I did. I mean, part of it was practice. Like I did, you do have to feel competent that you can improvise. So there's a lot of practice. So I picked up a lot of participatory <coughs> methods from theatre through, you know, where you could role play and act scenarios out with, you know, farmers and community groups um, through to um, I practiced all the causal mapping and how you get a group of people to do that effectively um, um, social network mapping as a participatory process I practiced all of that so a lot of practice, but I, did, I just felt like I traveled because I would, wasn't based there. So I traveled there and like half my luggage was like pens and post-it notes and blah, blah, blah. And I, you know, things would just get derailed all the time and you'd be working. You'd want to go where the energy was in the room, you know. And so you'd, you might, you'd always plan a session, I'd always plan a session, but be totally expected that partway through we would break off to go and literally see what they're doing to grow crabs in this particular area to get extra protein in their diet because people wanted to visualize and see it and so you go with the energy and then you pick up the stuff that you wanted to do later on or I worked a lot with um local well, they weren't researchers but they were young people that helped me a lot interpret the methods and practice them and um reflect on how that had gone and, and that's that process of refinement I suppose is it's I don't know whether it's customization so much as refinement um yeah that's you need a lot of confidence for this I mean I'm yeah. thinking um, you know, how, how can one generalize this so that many many more people have the, the, the confidence to go with the energy for instance yeah and to end up doing something well, I think, I mean, I'm very lucky. I mean, like, learning from the best is, is kind of helpful. And I was lucky that I got to do some, like, experiential training. We ran, I think we did five days on participatory, participatory systemic action research before I went anywhere. And I was already, you know, a researcher for 10, 12 years. But actually, sometimes that's hard when you're unlearning what you've learned before to work in a different way. Like, um, but it, But I think we have... To probably get more experiential in the way that we train, like the ha you know having handbooks and things like that. Um, you know, I was totally conceptually like, yes, this was it. You know, this is what I wanted to be doing. This is the way I wanted to be researching. But I still 
didn't really know what that meant in practice until I was there doing it and doing the training. I don't know whether you guys have a different perspective on that. I mean, one a question I was going to ask, which links to that, is that, so in listening to you, I, I kept thinking, so Jodie's talking about participatory action research, right? Mm -hmm. So, so being, but being explicit about the complexity framing, which I don't think is the same as just saying, I'm using a systemic mm -hmm. kind of approach. Um, so I wanted you to maybe talk a little bit about how much of this is about um, being skilled in participatory approaches and being immersed in a system in which you're working versus actually explicitly thinking about emergence or attractors or yeah. I, I think I think that there's it's subtle, but I, I don't think there are things that I would have noted or picked up on had I not had the language and the ideas of complexity. Can you give us an example? Um, yeah, um, so some of, so I could have, like, I figured out that um, all three things were important. So a sense of relatedness, competency, autonomy in the networks. But then through my inquiries with people that had least power in the system, I was able to see that their starting point meant that those things came in a very clear order to them. So they had to have that sense of trust first before they could even go about um, stretching themselves, building their skills, building their sense of competences to be actors and movers and shakers and change. But when they did build their competency, we then had to shout about it and make it as visible as possible in the network because then that shifted social norms around them. And again, that was something I just don't think I would have seen an opportunity for. It's, it's quite hard to explain. And then, um, yeah. Other questions, Kevin? So do you think there might be anything you might have missed by using a complexity lens? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I mean, maybe I don't know. I mean, I think I feel like partly why I'm here today is I start. You know, I wasn't wedded to that. Like I wasn't schooled in that way of working. And where I got to at the end of the research was I was more convinced by complexity and its applicability to studying human systems than less so. If you see what I mean. So I think that I'm got more belief in it than you know I it wasn't an ideological thing for me like it wasn't like this is what I was schooled in and this is what I wanted to know it was gonna it was gonna work and provide me all these insights like it wasn't really about that so but was there any situation that you think your previous training would have helped you find <coughs> a particular insight that complexity theory wasn't able to <coughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question, but I don't know. Um, no, I don't know. Jody, I'd like to pick up on one of your practical yeah. conclusions or a practice suggestion. If I understood correctly, you, you suggested maybe it would be interesting to place volunteers in... Mm more established formal settings. But don't you think that, you know, the kind of raw, decontextualized, even naive energy mm. that uh, volunteers bring, the reason that that kind of can come through is that they are set in often contexts where there is no hierarchy. They're just there. I mean, what happens but if you put them in a, an organizational setting mm. where there's a program and a log frame and there's managers yeah. and everybody's on the yeah. straight rails to deliver the thing, yeah. they're going to become, they're going to get swamped in that. Yeah. So whether you think that that energy is wonderful or not, I'm not so concerned about that, but just the idea that taking an individual volunteer yeah. actually has, in one, one way to look at it, is they have very little to contribute probably. Mm -hmm. And sticking them within a 
more complicated organizational setting may not amplify their potential impact, but actually neuter it. Well, I think there is a point about critical mass there. There is a point about um, there were a lot of volunteers acting and interacting and, and coming back to what complexity lens afforded is activity in itself became an attractive basin in the watershed because where they were active and inspiring people, they were bringing in resources. These, the power holders that were sat on this management council that couldn't come together and agree anything in a meeting were suddenly lending money to and resources to this basically volunteer generated activity over here, which was around protecting the ecosystem around solid waste management or coastal cleanups or tree plants or whatever. Um, and they were and they were really good at bringing people together from across the watershed and building empathy that actually my solid waste management practices at higher elevations are affecting water quality down here. But there was a critical mass of them. So whether they, that would they would lose that effect if it was an individual in an organisation. But I, but again, I think you, you'd be careful about where you positioned and placed them, probably into that organisational context, which has to deliver on funding and, and their value for money and log frame is probably not the place to situate them. The, the place to situate them is out in the communities with the people with least power, because they then build relationships and those people start to trust, those people start to get engaged in the process of change and then you start to see some their perspectives. So yeah, it's a good question. I think you'd have to be careful about where. Just maybe to follow on that, I mean, isn't this kind of what you do in your job currently? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any insights from working with organizations for maybe how they might yeah. use volunteers or, or even interns or something? Um, well, not so much interns, but I'm... I'm situating change much more at the team level. So within organizations, teams are vehicles for change. And yes, we're engaging with senior leaders, but we're taking that, you know, teams are amazing because they're diverse in perspective and individuals, but they have this collective shared sense of identity, which means they should care, right? And, and about their own well-being. So by moving, getting them working and acting on improving their work culture and how they feel, systemically you're seeing shifts in an organizational culture but it's very different from coming from a top-down lens so and uh, as an, yeah. sorry there were a couple of hands yeah. here and then katie maybe we'll take and then jay maybe we'll take the three yeah okay thank you very much for your talk i wonder if you could just tell i understood the complexity approach about um, looking at the systems and processes mm -hmm. but how does that relate to the actual outcome did you always get good outcomes? I mean, you might have dynamics happening through networks and so yeah. on, action happening, but was that because of taking into account all the processes that you're using the complexity approach? But did you always get good action happening from it? And the reason I ask this is, in, in health development, we have a rather different thing in consultants parachute in. They don't have the time that you have. But we have some horrendous mistakes happening because they parachute in and they don't really understand the situation. We get <coughs> bad outcomes, and sometimes those outcomes get, you know, buried somewhere. So I'm just, <laughs> so I'm just wondering, in, in all your insights and things, what about the actual outcome? Because the research question is, how does volunteering work? When and does it work? And what were these volunteers doing? And what was the outcome? Better ecological things or yeah. So, Maybe shall we take the other two? Yeah. Just yeah. in case people need to run off. Lucy and then Jay. Yeah. Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, um, I think one of the things I always find, so, I mean, I really, I'm really attracted to complexity theory. Like, it makes a lot of sense to me. But I think one of the things I feel like gets lost in complexity theory, and you did, I think you've, you've sort of skimmed across it. You've talked about things like identity and social norms. But it's like, you're talking about relationships, which I absolutely agree with you, it's really central, but relationships involve power. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was kind of the sort of power dimension of what was going on was kind of like maybe a bit too implicit in the presentation. And mm -hmm. I wondered if you could kind of explain a bit more about how you understood the role that power played, for, for example, around identity, mm -hmm. volunteers that were foreign, and you see them quite a lot of them mm -hmm. sort of from that. You said they were vulnerable, but they also probably had some power derived from that. So just how did you... Kind of weave that into yeah. your understanding of how the system is working. Yep. 
Um, thank you. Uh, my question is, how do you incorporate the action research part of the research to the your e-field um, research? Uh, essentially, the action research is more about the them and, and together, and then your research is, is basically basically you. And related to that is, um, could you tell us a little bit about the relationships you had with the participants? Mm -hmm. um, especially, like there was this one point when you said that you uh, you realized that the things on paper and reality didn't really uh, match. Mm -hmm. And how did the participants also react to these uh, the uh, findings that you had? And um, yeah, and maybe like how did you identify the participants? And, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, not in any particular order. I should probably do it in order, shouldn't I? Yours was on um, was relating the outcomes. outcomes. To the so, processes involved in this complexity approach. So yeah. So that was. The, so I thought I would be looking at the outcomes of what the volunteers were doing on the environment. You know how did that change? But actually, what we were looking at is something much more antecedent which was like how do you even get people mobilized and engaged and interested on on a topic on a subject for social change so it was that it shifted I suppose what the focus was so and this is about understanding the the problem context there wasn't any action happening right we had the structure set up it all looked great on paper but nothing was actually happening so within so understanding that allows you to think, well, what's the contribution that volunteers are making? But it was related to the reality on the ground, not the theory of change that had been um, devised. See? Yes, but if you if nothing was if your process is empowering people to mm -hmm. do things, mm -hmm. how can you be sure that they're doing things that are good for the environment as opposed to not so good for the environment? measuring at the same time some of these outcomes yeah well that I mean yes you could yes you can have that length that was beyond the scope of this particular research um, but yes you would want to be measuring if it, if it was an evaluation you would want to be measuring that and the relational and the processes um, but it's interesting that the the theory of change that they had for how these volunteers were working didn't mention the ways that they were working and the ways that it had mentioned were didn't match the reality of how they were working. So they didn't have an understanding of how volunteers were working, which is crippling them because they can't get funding anymore because now a lot of the... Um, and in fact, they've changed their way of... As a result of this research, VSO have positioned themselves as doing um, a relational approach to development. They've started to shift how they are communicating to funders about the way that they affect change. So, yeah, it's not that every volunteer was there doing great stuff um, and there would be some negative and some unintended negative outcomes and, you know, um, but I wasn't there doing an evaluation. But um, but it has shifted the way they've explained what they're doing. Um, it's given them a bit more confidence, I think, to say that they don't, that they work through relationships and they do relationship building and then they do a lot of the empowering work in that way um power yeah power was, <laughs> was um always everywhere um so your question was about power and identity just whether you could be a bit more explicit about how that how you understood that in relation to the, the sort of the system that you were seeing how it was function, being functioning so one of the things I didn't talk about earlier in that initial sort of systems map of the problem context was the um, governance paradigm that existed, which was very exclusionary in practice. I mean, it all looked good on paper. There were representatives of all the people's associations, farmers, residents, young people. But actually, when you talk to people about how they felt in those spaces, they didn't feel able to contribute. Um, so... The pat that power was there. Then I had there was a lot. I worked with quite a lot of young people in the end, like youth groups that wanted to take action on the environment, and they really struggled even within a Filipino context to get 
um, recognition and respect from elders. So there was a definite generational power differential there. It wasn't so much gender didn't come through the research very much at all. Um, so, and interestingly, and this is a, but with the, because well-being is quite fundamental to human motivation, through working with the least powerful to think about what motivated them to be involved with collective action, they learn about what the power, what would motivate the power holders to engage in environmental action. And they learn that actually feeling a sense of connection with someone is, is important for me, but it's actually important for that mayor too. So it made them think, well, actually, it's well within our power to foster that relationship with them. And it started to shift what they thought that they could do. And so simple things were like what they learned was if they presented themselves as a group of young people, it's a bit like that, but if they took it down to a one-on-one -on -one relationship or a one-or-two relationship, or they used me as that you know, outsider that they're curious to meet anyway, and we'd spend 10 minutes me chatting to them, and then I would just slowly fade into the background, and they would start to then take the conversation forward. You could start to weave them into these spaces, um, and once they were starting to act, that became an attractor. So it was like, well, actually, oh, they, have, they do know a bit what they're doing, and actually it's quite handy because they're actually trying to do some of this stuff that's on my log frame over there, which I know we're not working on, I've sort of been ignoring that we haven't been working on. So you start to see things shift, but it was very interesting that it was through understanding what motivated them that they were able to understand what motivated the power holders, then they were able to see that they could shift some of this. Um, yeah, and they used volunteers very much to practice. They practice in their own groups and they step outside and they practice because that felt like a safe relationship. And then as soon as they felt a bit more competent, they would take it onto a, a bigger scale. So they might run a community-wide event. Um, and so it would kind of, it was almost scaffolding their experiences. Um, I really <laughs> sleep deprived. I have like a short term memory impairment at the moment. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. sorry. When I, you say I think my question is because I'm. I'm in, oh, yeah, where I'm was I? Third year of, where of was my I? PhD as well. Yes. So it's like incorporating the action research yes. to your, yes, your yes. doctoral um, research. And then how does the relationship between uh, the participants work? Yeah. That. So it's really like, it's really difficult. <laughs> so participatory systemic action research is challenging because on traditional participatory paradigm, you would be with those actors in a way the whole time, and they'd be through the whole research. But when you're working with systemically, you are actually working across. You go probably less deep with people, but you're working across lots of different groups. So you are purposely seeding insights from one group to the next and it does create a slightly different relationship between you and them so then how you weave the way I could weave people back in was through analysis and validation so I would do some of that abstraction but then I would be bringing them back in to say this I've gone off over here and I've learned from all these people this is what I'm hearing does this make sense to you whatever and they would have and I found that people were okay with not being part of every bit of the process, so long as they trusted in the process that I would bring stuff back to them that was relevant at certain times, that they were involved at key points, I didn't really have the time anyway. The actual research was more in depth, you know, that was me working with a core group of eight to ten people over a year, and I was only there for some time and they would do bits in between our meetings um, and workshops. Um, and that I wrote a chapter on that specifically in the thesis because I wanted that to be sort of where it felt like it was at its most part, pure participatory. Um, and I don't, I'm so glad I did it, that piece, you know. Um, but I couldn't have, I couldn't have, don't, I don't think I could have worked systemically if action research would have been my methodology because it's so um intensive i don't think within one phd you could have run four different action research inquiries well i i couldn't and then, but i don't know 
just a kind of a reflection on that. Um, as the, the number of people doing PhDs using action research is growing, which I think is a very positive thing, I do one myself, um, then I think distinguishing the piece which is your, your research, mm. right, and finding your thesis piece mm. in that, but at the same time um, being ethical and true to a participatory process is, I think, a, quite a delicate balancing act. It does come down to how it's examined and mm -hmm. right, the epistemologies, etc. But what I think is really interesting here is that you're basically saying that doing systemic action research, which is so you're intentionally being systemic, means that you it's not the same as your classical action research mm -hmm. with a group where it's very deep, right? And you have that kind of and and I would add that it is um, it is a research design, right? In in the way that it's it's less, it's much harder for a practitioner in, in, in the NGO space, let's say, to take it and use it um, as an implementation methodology, whereas mm -hmm. PAR, if you like, or AR is often used in that way. Mm -hmm. So it's because it requires this, this artful facilitator at the center of all of these different inquiries, mm -hmm. right, that, that actually those insights, you can, you can seed them back and do the collective analysis, but you're driving it. Yeah. Which for a PhD process is absolutely appropriate and in fact quite useful otherwise. Yeah. Anyway, but, sorry to jump in. No, no, no. And I would say that um, this, you know, if you, if, oh, sorry, if you are working in this sort of way and creating meaningful action oriented insights locally, you've kind of done your job as an action researcher, then what you decide to draw and bring into your um, thesis, because I remember going to Danny and saying, I don't, you know, I'm sitting down to write this now, and, I, and as you're writing, you're still analysing, and I'm like, I'm not sure if I took this back to, would, how much of it would they recognise, and how and I was feeling quite uncomfortable, and he was like, but this is your thesis now. That, those insights were practical knowledge they were generated in the watershed when you were there and people acted and they used them. Yes, they did. But now I had a job to do, which was to knit a narrative across, you know, multiple bits of inquiry work. Um, and that was mine, actually. So, and it, that, but I felt uncomfortable with that for quite a while and then, yeah, yeah. found my way. <laughs> John, did you? Yeah, I, I just, really enjoyed this. Uh, and the discussion, it's really nice to hear somebody talking about their PhD research with A, confidence, and B, a lot of enthusiasm. It would be super clear presentation. Um, I want to come back to this question of power because there's something which I'm finding slightly surprising about your language and the way that you're speaking about power because at the times you quite easily and naturally talk about power holders and mm. people who didn't hold any power. And uh, for example, in response to Jim's question, talked about the difference between you know, placing volunteers among the people who don't have any power. And I thought, well, hold on, this is a complexity approach. And you know, complexity recognizes that power is, for example, immersion. It's distributed mm. through networks. Mm. It is uh, not necessarily belonging to individual agents. Yeah. It's not necessarily allocated yeah. um, by a sort of a structure or hierarchy. Mm, so I'm wondering where that comes from. Is it is it my, I, I, I'm guessing that it comes from that sort of immersive bit that you did at the beginning and you sort of began to detect empirically that there were certain groups that were experiencing powerlessness or telling you that they felt unable to do things. But then power also has this kind of latency, so that's what makes power often quite interesting is because nobody really knows what power they have until they try to do something and organisations maybe perceive or institutions maybe perceive them or individuals may be perceived to be powerful until they decide to do something and suddenly it doesn't work. So yeah. how did you deal with all of that? And why is it that you're so clear now that there were what you call power holders? People that you said had much power. Well, I think, I think like part of it's just about like trying to like use a language, you know, where people can just like when you're presenting grasp onto oh yeah they're the, the people that had the least if we'd say formal power like it's not it wasn't like my label that wasn't through the research it's probably just kind of mm 
like lazy semantics really but it was but it was but at the same time yes I definitely found that there were people that within the watershed you had a management council that was supposed to be responsible for looking after it and instigating all the environmental action that happened and there were people that felt more comfortable in those spaces than others and that was coming through so um and they would use they would talk about feeling shy not feeling able so those sorts of things were through their language um so i suppose that 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 was a definitely a dynamic that was definitely a dynamic but they did start to shift the way that they were perceived and the social norms through action. Yeah, so when they, when they actually started to do things, they sort of discovered that they, they did have forms of power that they could then use. Forms of power, yeah. Yeah, and so like I said, you know, that those well-being insights were definitely for them. They were like, okay, actually, what motivates me is what motivates they, it's just a person we we ran some exercises where we'd be like you know what do you think this person is like and what do you think they're thinking so we were building kind of empathy and perspective taking now a lot of research would probably go not or a lot of approaches would either go down like an individual empowerment route or it would go to work with the power holder to think about how they could be more participatory and inclusive and things like that i mean some of the actors in this um, um, <laughs> this network, I mean, just wouldn't even cut the mustard in terms of decent behaviour in an organisational setting, right? So you weren't going to just you weren't then going to be running sessions with them about how to be more participatory, inclusive. But the backdoor way in was creating spaces through volunteering and their networks for people to practice at being change makers, and that did affect then their own identities but then perceptions if we could make it visible if we could make what they were doing visible then it would start to shift perspectives about what young people were capable of or what farmers were capable of or whatever so i was very struck initially in the generic inquiry phase just how um disempowered people felt um one of the things that rose is in my mind with these approaches is that when, you, when you're going in um, with a fairly broad remit mm. and you're being open and you're um, seeing what's there, then there's this question of how do you bound it? Because right? mm. you, you could have written the whole thesis around this conversation mm. about okay. power. That wasn't you know, theoretically what the space you were necessarily trying to build in your PhD. But there is this question of how do you then... How do, you, how do you bound it, and how do you hold on to it, and how do you, because um, it can go in so many directions, right? You're looking at these large systems, very, you know, all of this interaction, all of these things going on. Well, that's, that's again, your way, well, that's your own positionality in it yeah. as well. Like, I came with my history and my interests. Mm. So I, there could have been a PhD on power, there could have been a PhD on resilience, particularly, yeah. because... Resilience in socio-ecological systems, it's a psychological phenomenon, it was fascinating, they had suboptimal resilience in the sense it was so high that they would rally around in response to disaster in Filipino culture so well, like enviable levels of support. But the build back better, the longer term we've got to, it just wasn't there. The end, the, so it, there was, and it was recognised in the academic, so that was fascinating, I could have gone there. I could have gone a lot of places but that's my own positionality that's that was my interest and again that's where you straddle between being purely participatory and holding the boundary around what your focus is and what your interest is um and that yeah and that's partly accountability in different directions as well like you know I've convinced Danny to supervise my PhD based on a particular topic and you know other things right um yeah, so I think that's the positionality is really important. And being really open up front with people about that being the broad emphasis for the research, but making myself meaningful to them in other ways, I suppose, and useful to them in other ways. There was very reciprocal 
the one thing we've tried to have constant across all the seminars so far is this idea of is complexity a science mm. or is it kind of a set of methods or, or tools? A metaphor. A metaphor, yeah. A science metaphor. or metaphor. Mm. Um, and so I wonder, you know, obviously in action research, there's this tension between what are, what are you learning, right? Mm. Learning to do or learning about something so that you can create change. Um, and as we've just been discussing, there's a difference between what the participants are learning and what you're learning that you'll write up. Um, you know, maybe going back to the question about health, mm. are there limitations or opportunities for this approach? What's, where's the line between learning something as academic knowledge and learning something as sort of creating solutions for things like health problems or ecological sustainability? I think, I mean, for me, I'm much more interested in the creating solutions. And I think if you go enter into a participatory process with people, that's where your responsibility lies. And you need to do the work afterwards to make it relevant to the academic community. And that's something you do in your office and you play that game. But I don't, that's what I mean. I oriented, I wasn't focused, I suppose, on what, how I was going to look credible and blah, blah, blah to the academic community. I was focused, for, I mean, I had to, but for the research, the write up and the PhD, but I was much more focused on the, the relationships I was having there and being useful and practical. The, the things you talk about, emergence and yeah. um, attractors and all, yeah. I mean, you're, you're being very careful to be precise about the scientific language yes. and complexity. Yes. Presumably that matters more than just... Yes, um, it does. You could use a purely metaphorical sense that yeah. threw all the science out the window if, yeah. it, if it was effective. Right? Yeah, and I think, that. yeah, and it was difficult to, because by the time I'd come to the end of the research, and I think that any proper complex research becomes really inter like, um, interdisciplinary really quickly. So, you know, I had social sociological theory, psychological theory. I had, I had to go figure out about collective action. I had to understand and school myself in natural resource management. It was like suddenly it was into, and then I wanted to layer in complexity and, and which was a whole new language as well. Um, but I think that if we don't change the language, we don't change the way we think. I think that these concepts are important. They shifted the way that I interpreted and, and engaged the relationship, the conversation I was having with the data, definitely, so it had to come through. In the end, in terms of literally the PhD, and it could be a format to use for other reporting, you know, I reported the findings and then I did a chap I did a chapter on complexity in terms of like what and that looked at all the feedbacks, all the interdependencies inter, um, and the interrelationships and the emergence. And I kind of found it like that as a sort of interim because I thought, you know, otherwise I'm mixing all these different disciplines and all their different theories and frameworks and models and then the complexity stuff as well. I was going to lose the reader. So yeah, I have two questions. So first of all, thank you. It was mm -hmm. fascinating. Uh, so the one is was related to, to this focus and how you keep the balance between uh, the change and the support you're giving and, and the research you're doing. So it goes back to uh, you were saying look for insights, not for data, because mm -hmm. data could be too much, but probably in such a process, especially if it's systemic, even insights tend to explode and, and mm. you keep like getting more and more and more ideas. You, you, you said about saturation, but I want to ask you about, did you have some kind of process to make sure that regularly uh, you were kind of um, becoming aware yeah. of where your insights were bringing you and uh, how to refocus them? Yeah. Or so on the practical level, so what kind of process? And mm. the second question is just uh, about the practicality. So, you were interacting with many groups, uh, especially with this systemic, you were not staying all the time. So how did you, how were you motivating people to be part of, mm. of these processes? And, and something very simple, uh, what about uh, language? Mm -hmm. How was this limiting yeah. or uh, affecting uh, what you could do yeah. and what you could uh, learn? Um, so 
the first point, I mean, every day that I was in the field, I would come back and write, not like transcribe the sessions, but I would write down the key insights that day. And that became like a process that you just had to do. And then uh, at, at key stages, like the storyboarding after I'd collected so many, I would sit down and analyse it. And then you'd be thematically um, looking at it um, creating theme categories, creating insights underneath that, and then taking that back to people to say, you know, how does this fit with your experience? This is what we've, you know, learned mm -hmm. collectively yeah. together. Um, language was, um, I mean, I learned bits, but I didn't, while I was in the Philippines, I worked across lots of different islands. <laughs> they all speak different language, not even dialect. So I largely went through English, but I did learn some Vishayam when I was there, but I worked through translators. So I, so some of my core research group there were bilingual. Um, and we just had to work on a process of, I mean, we just had to practice, but whereby, you know, they would be translating in real time to me um, and as much as possible not um, paraphrasing because sometimes the detail is where the resonance is or the detail is yeah. is um, is where the story is in a way so um, and if, but it, and and you then have to keep those sessions quite short because it's tiring to work in that way and not for me so much as the interpreter Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left and Robert wants to no, jump in. I, I, this is not a question to answer now. <laughs> but the question is, given your very rich experience and what you've learned from all this, and from the whole PhD process that you've been through, what advice would you give to pioneers? What advice would you give to supervisors? What advice would you give to students which they don't, don't normally don't try to answer it <laughs> because it's too late. But I think I think I think it's such a rich and fertile experience that you shared with us that many more people ought to benefit from it. And particularly I think this issue around I started with questions about confidence. Mm. And I, I think I think the confidence not to have a method <laughs> um, in a formal sense, uh, because because having a method, um, you know, it gives you a, a great sense of security. All I've got to do is do this. Yeah, no. and, you, know, you have the diagrams. This is my research. Yeah, no. This is what I'm going to do at this stage, at this yeah. stage, at this stage. And then people say, well, I don't think you've left long enough in writing your book. Yeah. You know, yeah. This sort of thing. This is a totally different universe that yeah. you've been exploring and developing. Yeah. And I, I, I hope that one way or another this experience can be shared much more widely. Yeah, thank you. And I think on that note, we should say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. <laughs> no, it's good discussion. Yeah, I mean, all the way from the way you design your research, <laughs> how do you how do you get through step one of the PhD process through the <laughs> You know, through to examination, and actually the um, Action Research um, Plus network run by Hilary Bradbury is very interested in building resources for students who are using Action Research in their PhDs. Mm. So it'd be great actually to connect you up with yeah. them yeah. in terms of, yeah.